evening, everybody. Welcome to another live episode of The Breakdown. It's October 6th, 2024. I'm your host, Nate Pike. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Uh, Alberta politics was as Alberta politics is prone to being these days. Uh, so there's no shortage of things to talk about. And we are going to get it towards the end of the show. Uh, we got us a fight back. We did. And it's another spicy one. So stick around for that part. Before we get into it, we're going to do something that we haven't, uh, we've never done before. We're going to take a quick sec and say, happy anniversary, Stephen. There you go. Jumping right into things, though. One of the big conversations that's been going on in the province of Alberta around the question of what are the agendas, what are the groups, what's going on, uh, has had to do with women's right to access health care, women's right to access abortion. Now, for a little bit of context, a few years ago under the NDP, there was a law that was put into place that basically said, hey, you know what? We believe in freedom of speech. We believe in your charter rights to freedom of expression. We're not quite sure though, if that includes uh, harassing and victimizing women who are attempting to access abortion services. That seems like maybe that's not so much in the spirit of a charter, when it's not just a protest, when it's actual harassment of people who are, are simply trying to access health care. Uh, the NDP put that rule in. And apparently there's some folks who not only don't like it. They've got some money to spend on some advertisements because we couldn't help but notice that this week our uh, the our, our Alberta um, friendly neighborhood mm, is it still friendly neighborhood when your publisher is uh, waiting to hear a verdict on whether or not he threatened kids? I'm just not sure. It's so complicated these days. Uh, the Western Standard started running this advertisement right here. And what this advertisement is, is it's uh, saying to pop the Alberta bubble zones. The bubble zones are those areas around abortion clinics that I mentioned earlier, where it's saying, hey, you know what? Maybe maybe, maybe a little bit of a buffer space between the people who are making some of the hardest decisions of their life, potentially, and the, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for here? The assholes who want to enforce their own beliefs on them. Maybe there should be a little bit of a, a buffer zone in between those two things. Well, somebody is paying to run ads on the Western Standard because, of course, it's the Western Standard, making the argument that you should sign a petition if you believe in free speech. There are certain places where it's reasonable to say this is private property. There are certain places where it's reasonable to say, hey, you know what, you can you can have your free speech, but maybe not inflicting it on another person, maybe not putting up graphic images. Maybe that's not the, the, the bestest of the ways to go, but nonetheless, Western standards running those ads, but, and it's been, uh, it's been a bit of a break for the, for the kids at the Western standard. We can help but notice that shortly after we did our, uh, our episode where we talked about the Western standard who absolutely doesn't take Justin Trudeau's subsidies. is very happy to take Danielle Smith's subsidies, because not only has she been funding to have the Western Standards content funneled into a news aggregator, she's paid for subscriptions and the, the tens, if not hundreds, is uh, for government of Alberta employees who want to read the, the Western Standard. Um, she's also there's also been some government advertising that's gone towards the Western standard. Um, now we've got uh, a request in to see if we can get the numbers, but it's back after like a six month break. It seems the Western standards advertising is back uh, with the government of Alberta, which you assume they're getting the monies for. So they're, they're telling people to skip student debt and go right to the money-making part by getting into the trades. Now, to be clear, this isn't a dunk on the trades. It's just an observation that a news organization that says if you take any money from the government, um, then you're corrupt, but only if it's Justin Trudeau's government. If you take money from the conservative government, then it's fine. If you take it from Danny, that's not in any way corruptive. You see, it's not the principles. It's the people would apparently be the logic, which is absolutely not true. Moving on from there. And this is, we're going to get through the, the short ones quick because we've got some bigger things to, to unpack as we get through this episode tonight. We're going to see if we have time, hopefully at the end for our, uh, our town hall um, 
which is truly open to anybody who's on the Twitter spaces. You don't have to have a, a breakdown membership to engage with us. Um, we, we, we certainly wouldn't revoke any, we don't sell memberships. I'm just doing a bit from last week's episode. Um, but cost of living has been one of the big conversations that's been going on in the province of Alberta and across all of Canada. And some of you may be, it's getting harder to avoid the, the BC folks. It, they seem to be deeply committed to trying to uh, show Alberta how it's uh, it's really done when it comes to the wait what in politics. And so there's been a lot of this is the one party that stopped being a party and then they folded into the conservative party and then it's a whole thing and the conspiracy theories there, too. But cost of living. Top of the issue. And we saw a fascinating little piece of analysis from economist Jim Stanford on the Twitter machine, where he was talking about uh, StatsCan information, readily accessible to anyone, that shows the difference in insurance prices across the country. How much? Who's done well over the last six years? Who has not done well over the last six years. And you, I think the point that Mr. Stanford was going for, I suspect, was probably, hey, you know what? Um, BC's actually done really well. Our, our insurance costs have actually gone down. And if you take a look at the actual graph, what it actually shows is there's been a net reduction of 6.6% in the cost of insurance towards BC. But if you go just one province over and one line over on the graph, there's Alberta. And this is stunning because between 2017 to 2023, the cumulative change for passenger car insurance premiums went up over six years, 41.8%, which is the worst in all of Canada, which is really quite stunning. And it's stunning not only because... Uh, that's not an Alberta advantage. Being number one for the most expensive increase in insurance premiums is not is not an advantage. But it's also fascinating because it's one of the things that the UCP actually have direct levers that they could influence. They could put caps on insurance premiums. They could put caps on increases in insurance premiums. A lot of different things that the UCP could do, but they haven't done those things. We are don't worry. I know everybody's just, I chose the shirt is a deliberate choice this week. Um, we, they have done some other things that we're for sure going to talk about later, but they haven't done anything meaningful clearly to address the cost of insurance, which brings us to, and this is the wild thing. Normally we save the, the really off the rails stuff. I'll say cautiously, normally we save this for the for the end of the show, but it's been just that kind of week in Alberta that we're going to just start in with the the really, really wild stuff right out of the gates, because Danielle Smith has been having, um, I guess you could possibly call them town halls. Um now, calling them town halls is a little bit disingenuous. It's a little bit problematic because historically at a town hall, everybody from the town is able to go. But these haven't been town halls in that sense. What these have been is UCP member meetings uh, where everybody can come and they can ask their questions as long as they have a UCP membership and Dustin Van Vaught is not very, very, very angry at them. Uh, then they can go and they can attend and they can ask their questions. Now, what's wild about these town halls is, A, they've been recorded, uh, as we've seen, and B, they, they again capture Danielle Smith in her natural element. And we're going to play the clip um, because if you somehow manage to miss it, uh, it really is, is something to behold because... And we're going to start with this clip, but it's important to highlight. We got a couple other clips from the same town hall that we're going to talk about. Uh, but we're going to start with the, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to start with the chemtrail one. I've been able to, to do is talk to the woman who is responsible for controlling the airspace. And she says, no one is allowed to go up. 
and spray anything in the air. We have a, oh, she's told me. The other person told me that if anyone is doing it, it's the US Department of Defense. And you know, like I, I, I have some limitations in what I can do in my job. I, I don't know that I would have much power if that is the case, if the US Department of Defense is, is uh, spraying us. So I, I will do what I can to investigate, but I, everywhere I have gone, I have found no evidence that there's any private sector company involved, my environment department's not involved, my, and, uh, my airports tell me that they, uh, they have a record of every single plane that goes up. So I, I'm, I'm kind of dead-ended here. If you have, have some special lead that you want to give me afterwards, please let me know and I'll track it down. Now, there have been some people who have tried to unpack that clip. Uh, there have been some pundits, some, some media uh, elites, let's call them, uh, who have said, well, you know, here's what happened. Danny was starting to give the answer. She was starting to say, hey, you know what? Um, maybe the chemtrail is not so much a thing, but she could tell because she's such a uh, skilled communicator sure we can go with that uh that she was losing the room so she did what any good communicator would do and she said but it could be the united states department of defense because you know it has been a little while since the the premier of alberta has initiated an international incident let's get it let's get it done let's let's get another one on the books shall we um and there's a lot of problems with that argument. So first of all, if Danielle Smith was hosting just her radio show or she was just hosting, I don't know, a, a live streaming podcast or something like that, then if you're looking for an entertainer, if you're looking for a pop star, somebody who's able to read the room and adjust their performance so that it meets the needs and expectations of the people who paid tickets to, to go see, I don't know, NSYNC or something, then, uh, yeah, there's an argument to be made there because reading a room and directing the energy of a of a room of a live room is is a skill. Now, there's a lot of performers who would say I don't do that because I I do my my art or my performance for for me as an expression of my own thing. But there are a lot of performers whose job it is to go out there, read the room, give the room what they want. Uh, and the, the argument is that's what Daniel Smith was doing. But she wasn't just doing a radio show. She wasn't just acting in the capacity as a, a pundit or a media personality. She's acting in the capacity as the premier of Alberta. And this is where it, it takes a certain degree of actual leadership to be able to say to somebody who's asked a question like that, hey, you know what? Um, you know, I appreciate where you're coming from. And I know there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there that's, that's around this particular topic. I know there's a lot of people who have some really strong feelings about this particular topic. But I have to tell you, it simply isn't true. The, the trails that form behind the planes, that's water condensing because of of altitude that's really all it is it's no different than when steam comes out of out of chimneys um, so i'm very very sorry to have to take that position with you but i'm afraid that's just the the reality and the and the truth that's what you would expect from a leader especially if they were trying to give the person who was asking the question some some dignity or or maybe not just respond with a that stupid no and I feel like I can speak with a little bit of experience on that topic because when we've had our call-in sections on the show before, we've certainly, we don't screen them. We're not your province, your premier. Um, and there have been people who have come on and said some, some, some pretty outlandish things. And as the host of the show, it's been my responsibility to say, well, that's not true. And thank you very much. That's part of the role. And if Danielle Smith is so equi ill-equipped for the role of premier that she isn't able to say uh, no, that's not a thing in a, in a gentle way and be okay with losing that particular room or that particular segment of the room, then she's not fit for the job of premier. It's just that simple. And in fact, there's even an argument to be made that if any of her MLAs and ministers who were surrounding her knew anything about the, the art of politics, they would have jumped on that hand grenade for her and said, you know what, let me take that one. Here's, here's the reality. It's not a thing. 
I know there's a lot of people who think it's a thing, but it's not a thing. And I'm not going to let the uh, I'm not going to stand by idly while the premier has to answer a question like that. But none of them did that either, because Daniel Smith wants the microphone at all times. There's 50 different ways that she could have avoided that question short of creating an international incident, but create an international incident. She sure did. And so we saw over the course of the next couple of days, journalists actively going out and uh, having to talk to the Pentagon, <laughs> talk to NORAD, talk to Nav Canada, Sean Amato. Um, this tweet is just pure gold. So I was emailing with the Pentagon ellipsis. They say they don't know what Alberta Premier Daniel Smith is talking about. I realize this will not convince any chemtrail believers. I'm just doing my job over here. And the Pentagon PA duty officer press operations said, hey, Sean, we do not have anything to provide. You'd have to ask her what she meant. Uh, also, NORAD would be the appropriate group to speak about joint U.S.-Canadian operations over Canada. But that didn't stop there. Um, Press Progress did a whole story on the uh, NORAD allegations. Uh, the Pentagon and NORAD are denying Alberta Premier Daniel Smith's suggestion that they're spraying chemicals over Alberta. Charles Russnell. Investigative uh, reporter for the TIE, long history of investigative journalism. Uh, not sure who the woman that Daniel Smith said controls the airspace over Alberta, but NAVCAN does. And they said they have no contact from anyone in the Alberta government about chemtrails. And this is where it starts to get particularly uh, interesting because Daniel Smith in that clip said, Hey, you know what? I've I've done my due diligence. I've investigated. Oh, I've investigated this. Nobody knows anything. I talked to the lady. <laughs> there's there's no one lady. I talked to the lady who runs the airspace. She says there's there's no chemtrails. Um, and the the press secretary, Daniel Smith's new press secretary, maybe that's relevant for a little bit later. Um, issued a statement to, again, Sam Amato, where she said the premier has heard concerns from many Albertans about this topic. In response, the provincial government looked into the issue and found no evidence of chemtrails occurring in Alberta. The premier was simply sharing what she's heard from some folks over the summer on the issue. She was not saying that she believed that the U.S. government was using chemtrails in Alberta, except that is kind of what she was saying. What she was saying was, there's nothing on our end, but if there is, you should go talk to that guy. She was using the United States Department of Defense as a literal scapegoat. Literally, that's what the term means. I'm going to put it on this person over here. They'll make the problem go away for me. That's literally what she was doing. So the the retconning statement from the, the premier's new press secretary is a fascinating statement to make, but it also again, doubles down on the idea that Alberta government, taxpayer-funded Alberta government resources, looked into the question of chemtrails. But apparently not with any of the people who would actually know if that was a thing, which unequivocally, let's be clear, it's not. It's, it's not a thing. It's just, it's, it's not. But that wasn't all that Daniel Smith uh, shared some thought. That's the clip that got all the attention. But there's a couple of other things that we wanted to, to highlight that came out of that particular uh, town hall. One of them was a question in regards to family support for children with disabilities. As my, um, my, my minister concerned, He's worried that uh, people are moving here just to be able to access the, the benefits that we do have, which is what made me, making the waiting list longer and not allowing us to clear that backlog. So we, we have to do something about that. And I, I don't know if it's a, a matter of having a qualifying period where you have to be here for, like we do this as well. If you leave the country, you have to come back for six months before you're allowed to get health care again. So we're, we're looking at ways to make sure that we put those who've been on the, the list the longest, make sure that we're addressing their needs. The, the demand is extraordinary. I mean, we had 200,000 people come in 2023. We've had, I think, already 50,000 people come at the beginning part of this year. And so as a, we, we want to make sure that we can keep up with growth. Now, 
<sighs> it's getting a little tiring. The constant answer to the mismanagement of a number of programs being attributed to, ah, it's just been the last 18 months because first of all, that would have been under this government, under this premier. So, hmm, not quite sure how that's a get out of jail free card, but the constant returning to the idea of, oh, it's all these new people. It's all the immigrants is a ugly, untrue dog whistle. And it's unfortunate that Premier of Alberta doesn't seem to be able to recognize what the actual requirements are to get access to the uh, Alberta Health Care Insurance Plan or AHCIP. Because you could just go to the Government of Alberta website and you could just read off of the Government of Alberta website, you are eligible for Alberta health care insurance plan coverage if you are legally entitled to be in and remain in Canada and make your permanent home in Alberta, committed to being physically present in Alberta for at least 183 days in any 12-month period, um, not claiming residency or obtaining benefits under claim of residency in another province, territory, or country, any person, uh, any other person deemed by the regulations, regulations to be a resident or temporary resident, not including a tourist, transient, or visitor to Alberta. So if you live in Alberta and you plan on staying here for at least half the year, then you're eligible for Alberta health care. Period. And it's not even, it's important to, to highlight that it is not that you've been documented to have been in the province. That's not the language that's on the Government of Alberta website. The website is that you are committed to being physically present in Alberta for at least 183 days in any 12-month period. This is how a lot of snowbirds get to keep their Alberta health care coverage. You just have to be committed to it. So... If somebody was able to demonstrate that you had been not in the country for 183 days in a 12 month period, then you might be able to you might be getting yourself into a little bit of trouble. But Alberta healthcare exists as a creature of the Canada Health Act. So anywhere somebody goes in Canada, they're supposed to get the same kinds of services. Now, access to those services may be up for a little bit of debate, but again, those services for people who are covered under Alberta health care are prioritized on a number of different factors. It's just not, I'm the new person and raised my hand. It's not how it works. So the notion that there are a boatload of people who are moving to Alberta just to access Alberta health care and making that commitment to live here for six months because they really want their hip surgery or they really want their knee surgery is at best a bit of a stretch, if not a statistical rounding error. But that's not all that Danielle Smith uh, decided that she wanted to, to bring up. She wanted to talk about the state of healthcare delivery because somebody asked her the question about, hey, what about Edmonton South a uh, hospital. We were supposed to get a hospital. There was money set aside. I, I remember there was this former justice minister of yours uh, who maybe had a propensity for speeding tickets and violating the uh, Ethics Act and trying to interfere in the administration of justice. Um, he, he said that the, the funds were secured. What's going on? Like the Airtree feels the exact same way. So let me tell you what uh, we're looking at doing. So Airdrie was also bur bursting at the seams the same way. So they developed an urgent care center, and I just went and toured it. It's an old public library. They have like styrofoam walls and shower curtains that are divvying up the, the, uh, the different uh, treatment base, and that's not appropriate either. So we know that we need to develop a different type of urgent care center that allows you to have a place to go for emergency. And maybe the inpatient beds can be somewhere else if we're doing surgery somewhere else. So we're going to have a, a model for a new urgent care center that can be rolled out in these high demand areas, but also in rural Alberta as well. So there's a whole strategy coming. We won't, we have to make sure that we, we're putting the, the right type of a, a facility in the right place. So I'll take that away. Then. So again, if you've been following the show, we've talked about this before. Danielle Smith is showing her hand because the, the facility that she's talking about in Airdrie 
was an $85,000 gift to a physician and his, his company in Airdrie um, to develop a business case for a private for-profit, still taxpayer funded, but private for-profit urgent care center slash giant primary care facility. This is the facility that would have the urgent care, emergency medical care on the main floor. And then on the second floor would be a private doctor's office. Now, again, it's not a big deal to have a private doctor's office because almost all doctor's offices in the, in the province of Alberta are private companies. That's just how the, the business of doing primary care has worked in the province of Alberta, mostly across the country as well. So that's not anything new. But to say we're going to get this private for-profit company to administer emergency health care, that is brand new. And it touched off a big firestorm in Airdrie because a lot of people were asking, hey, what's going on with this? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense because normally if I want to go to an emergency room or an urgent care, then I just go and that's run by Alberta Health Services. But Daniel Smith has made it very, very clear that she wants to dismantle Alberta Health Services. And so she's using Airdrie as a trial ground to beta test this idea of well, what if we just had uh, one big urgent care that was run by a private profit company using taxpayer dollars and uh, they did the urgent care stuffs. And if that works, then we could just drop that all over the, the province. Heck, we could maybe d export it to different parts of, of Canada. Wouldn't that just be, wouldn't that just be delightful? It's like the Peter Lougheed era hospitals in rural Alberta, but for profit, which is problematic because if you're going to spend let's say $10 million, I'm making up numbers, but let's say you're going to spend $10 million on an urgent care facility in Airdrie that's going to be administered and run by a public body. There's no need for a profit margin. But if you have a private company doing it, that does have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, to their owners, to turn a profit, something's got to give. There's going to be things that happen in that private for-profit privately owned for-profit facility, there's going to be corners that get cut. And there's no shortage of evidence to back that up. So that's the model that Daniel Smith is very clearly saying, oh, it's not just a trial in, in, in Airdrie. This is a beta test for a much larger deployment and a redesign of healthcare across the province. Sticking with the... The theme, though, of, of the shirt, um, we're going to switch gears and we got to come back. And I can't believe we have to do this again. We're talking about the electronic vote tabulator. We have a picture of a vote tabulator and it looks just like a Scantron machine. You'll see nowhere is there a I'd like to vote for candidate A or candidate B because electronic tabulators are not what's used to cast votes. Electronic tabulators are used to count votes. Two very, very, very different things. The paper ballots still exist. They're just counted by a machine to get you quicker results, which should be in just about every universe you would think of fine. But there has been a conspiracy theory that's been imported from the United States largely in regards to the the election tampering that saw Donald Trump lose the election that he rightfully lost. If my voice doesn't convey it, I'm doing a lot of air quotes because the that had to do with the Dominion lawsuit, the Dominion election uh, voting machines lawsuit. Dominion sued Fox News. Dominion took Fox News out for an absolute walk. Tucker Carlson was fired from Fox News. And this is where, again, the, the, the ecosystem of the, the far right media piece gets to be really important to unpack. Because in that whole lawsuit, there were a bunch of text messages that were shared where most of the major personalities knew that they were lying to their audience. 
They knew that they were manipulating their audience. They knew that they were just trying to make their audience as angry as they possibly could so they could sell, I guess, catheters. Um, I don't watch Fox News. It's been a while, but I do remember there being a lot of catheter commercials and oats. I don't know. Um, but they lost that lawsuit. Fox News did. So the whole question of uh, the tampering with the electronic voting machines is a not a thing and b not at all relevant to the question of electronic tabulators. And there has been some conflation that has occurred by somebody who you would think knows how elections work in the province of Alberta. Machines is actually a perfect example. Because today we mm -hmm. saw the members of Alberta municipalities vote 85 percent. They don't want you to take away their vote counting machines because it's going to cost them money. It's going to cost them human resources. 85 percent. So this is one of the latest examples. Some would argue. Uh, some of your critics would argue um, that you are governing right now in the interests of a very narrow set of people. In your How would you react to that criticism? Uh, that, that right now you're governing for about five thousand people are going to show up to the AGM and not all Albertans. Look, we're 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 not always going to agree with the municipalities. They also debated a motion to allow permanent residents the ability to vote, even though our constitution says you have to be a citizen. So those are the kind of things where um, the, you have to make sure that municipalities are going to honor the laws of our land and. Um, one of the things I would say about uh, municipal government is that they operate within the parameters that we set under the Municipal Government Act. They they are a creature of the munici of the provincial government. And as a provincial government, we have heard that uh, people want to go back to paper ballots. So we've started with the municipalities and we're going to be doing, the, doing that at the provincial level too. Did you catch it right at the end there? People want to go back to paper ballots. Implication being, we've stopped using paper ballots. It's a pretty, pretty clear little, little, little torquing of, I don't know, reality to say people want to go back to paper ballots. Because again, these are tabulating machines that count the ballots that are paper. It doesn't get rid of the paper ballots. It just counts them in a perfect world faster. But maybe she was just mis misspeaking. It's not like, as we showed last week, there's a second clip where she doubles down on this idea that somehow in the province of Alberta, we've abandoned paper ballots, is there? It's just, um, does did things get better or worse when we moved away from paper ballots and they got worse? Were we able to validate a close race is better or worse? Well, it got worse. I mean, you don't make a decision that, uh, that makes things uh, pr progressively worse and not, then not sort of revisit the original decision. So um, they blew it. And because they blew it, people are wanting to go back to paper ballots. So that's what we're going to do. That was Danielle Smith on Your Province, Your Premier, on September 28th, just two days after the municipalities conference, where she again, she didn't just say people want to go back to paper ballots. She straight up says that we moved away from paper ballots. And that is not true. She didn't just say it once in that clip. She says it twice. It's a lie. It's a lie that feeds into the conspiracy theories of, oh, well, we had these electronic voting machines. And Daniel Smith said it on a radio show. We moved away from paper ballots. The premier of Alberta wouldn't lie, would she? It's not like she's ever said to a room of people, on a broadcast that she has actually a fairly firm grasp of the difference between tabulators and electronic voting machines, is there? Some concern about it, but I have confirmed through our department officials that all of the votes on election day will be hand counted. My understanding of how these voting machines work is that it is a paper ballot and even though the tabulation takes place electronically, we retain a paper ballot so that if there is 
any issue of needing to do a recount, we'll be able to, to go back to, to the, the paper ballots to do that. So I, I'm, I'll, uh, I've asked my, um, my department officials um, uh, to look into it again, just to make sure that there aren't any concerns. And they've come back to me and, and told me that, uh, that the hand count will take place the day of, and that we will retain paper copies in the event that there is any issue that needs to, uh, to require a recount. Just as a follow-up here, I mean, we've all seen what happened in the U.S. presidential election where millions of Americans, you know, doubt the legitimacy of their election results. Considering that a lot of Albertans do have problems with tabulators, would it be better just simply not to use them and to count all the ballots by hand, including those in the advanced polls? You know, I've, I've used um, Scantron machines before where you have a paper ballot and then it goes through and it's uh, electronically tabulated. And I've also witnessed, even in my home uh, town of, of High River, they had to do that very same night, a hand count, because it was so close. So I, I have confidence that, that uh, because we have the ability to do a hand count as a follow-up in the event, there are close results that I, I, I believe that that's going to be sufficient. I think that the issue in the United States was that there are machines where you don't also have a, uh, a paper tabulator. My understanding is that we're going to, to retain both so that we are always able to make sure that we can do a secondary count if the, if the count is close. That's, I think, something that people expect of democracy, that you should be able to verify a vote if, if uh, results end up very close. So just to be clear, that was Danielle Smith in April of 2023, just over a year ago, where she had a full grasp of the difference between electronic tabulators and electronic voting machines. So much so that she even pushed back against David Parker's wife. That was Rachel Emanuel, now going by Rachel Parker, uh, who was asking that question, saying, well, so many Albertans have problems with the tabulators. Just because you say something that you want to be true doesn't make it true. What does make it true, though, is when the premier of Alberta leans into that narrative, which is demonstrably false because the premier demonstrated it to be false. What makes it real is when she starts to then turn around and in multiple different venues, including one, which is a radio uh, program that gets turned into a bunch of different formats as well, that goes out to the entire province. It goes out to the two biggest municipalities, Calgary and Edmonton, and all of the broadcast areas. And then as well, for anybody who has uh, internet, they can do the internet radio now. For her to say on there that the province of Alberta has moved away from paper ballots is demonstrably false, and it's a lie. And it's a lie that feeds into conspiracy theory rhetoric. And the reason why this is so important, A, to call out, but B, to highlight, well, there's a couple of reasons, actually. So the first reason why it's so important to call out is because Danielle Smith has a huge pulpit she has a huge microphone that she gets to avail herself of whenever she chooses. And if you have a microphone and you have the privilege of having an audience of any kind, then you have a responsibility to make sure that you're not deliberately and willfully misleading people. But the fact that Danielle Smith a year ago knew that and has since changed her mind to somehow Alberta has in the last year moved away from paper ballots. We haven't. Demonstrates the willingness to lie to her audience. And you don't have to suppose why. It's pretty clear. But it's part of a broader theme. Daniel Smith is leaning into this rhetoric because she's got her AGM coming up in a few weeks. And at that AGM, there's going to be a leadership review. And if she doesn't get really great numbers at that leadership review, it will mean her job and it will potentially mean her legacy as well. But it's also part of a much larger trend. And this is the part that Albertans, and yes, the, the two maybe three conservatives who listen to this show should be really alarmed by. Because when it's in Danielle Smith's own interest, she will lie to you. She will do it convincingly. She will do it well. And that only makes it more dangerous. 
And this brings us to another one of Daniel Smith's poor relationships with the truth. Some of you might remember uh, a little while ago, um, September 1st, in fact, Daniel Smith announced that there was going to be oh, it's going to be a broadcast to the, the province. They bought the airtime and it was going to go out on all the news centers and it was going to be this huge announcement for how Daniel Smith was going to uh, f- fix something. I think it might have been education. Um, what she announced wasn't um, that. What she announced was a new accelerator program. And what this accelerator program was, is it was going to increase the K through 12 capital budget by 8.6 billion by 2026, 2027. Now there's a bunch of verbiage in there that we have to take a sec to make sense of, because when we're talking about the K through six capital budget, we're talking about the buildings part. We're talking about the structures, but embedded in this, there were also a few other changes. One of them is historically when the province has built a new school, they've turned around and they've handed it to the school board in that area to operate. And this is also important to maintain what the province has said with this announcement is, um, but what if we kept it? Because that way, we still have the capital on our books. So despite the fact that we spent $8.6 billion, we'll also be able to say that we own $8.6 billion worth of buildings. So no loss, which is a clever accounting trick. But as with a lot of the policies that we've seen from Daniel Smith, it's not particularly well thought out because the immediate question is then, okay, so let's say a water fountain breaks. Let's say there's flooding. Well, if the province of Alberta are the people responsible for the building, how quickly can they move the pieces into place in that one community to get the flooding addressed? Historically, that's something that would have been done in-house through organizations like the Edmonton Public School Board or the Calgary Board of Education. Now... Now the province is maybe going to be assuming that risk. But one of the other things that they announced is that they were also going to be expanding this program to include private for-profit schools. Now, Daniel Smith really likes to call them independent schools because freedom of choice and junk. But there's two very basic truths that you have to acknowledge when you're talking about independent schools. First of all, we're not talking about schools like the, the the Calgary Board of Education, where the goal is to, all right, let's take as much money as we can and put it directly towards the students and the teachers and the things and the stuff. As soon as you're talking about these private for profit independent schools, now you're talking about, OK, so how do we pay for some of the things for the kids, but also uh, our president, Joe? Ah, he wanted that new yacht and he needs a dock too. So I guess we're going to have to figure out how we're going to move some of the money away from the kids into the heavily padded salaries of the people who own the school. Well, they own the, the contents of the school, but not the building. But this is where the second piece gets to be really problematic because when we're talking about the vast majority by number of independent schools, we're talking about religious schools. And that's fine. If somebody wants to have a private for-profit religious school, I mean, you could take that up with whatever deity you choose to you choose to subscribe to. But there's some details here that again don't appear to be particularly thought out. One of them we learned this week is what's the process? Because there's two uh, Muslim schools in Edmonton that have already reached out to the provincial government and said, hey, we would really we, we have the ground. We have the shovels. We have the permits. We'd like to build our religious school, please. And thank you. Uh, We would like to get this money, please. And the response from the government has been. Oh, yeah. Well, see, Danny made the announcement, but she didn't like we don't have a we don't know how to, how we're going to do that yet. So we don't have a process yet. We're going to work on that. We'll get back to you. So great big announcement without any of the things having actually been done yet is a little bit problematic. But even more problematic is if the province of Alberta says to one of these religious schools, and I want to be clear, I don't care what religious school it is. If it's a private, independent, for-profit school that's getting taxpayer money, 
if you can say no to students getting into your school, I have some questions, just speaking for myself personally. And it doesn't matter what religion you're a part with. There's just some questions. I'm not sure the taxpayer money should be going towards those things. I haven't seen a convincing, compelling argument for that as of yet. But that argument only gets compounded when you think about the fact that when you're talking about many of these religious schools, they'll have things like chapels. And so that means that the province of Alberta, the government of Alberta, will be in the business of owning and maintaining religious spaces. Because if we're talking about a Christian school that has a chapel, then we're talking about the government of Alberta owning and maintaining a chapel. If, conversely, if we're talking about a Muslim school, most Muslim schools have mosques in them. So now we're going to have the government of Alberta owning and maintaining mosques, which becomes deeply, deeply problematic on a whole bunch of levels. And the point, again, is not to dunk on any of these religious institutions. If uh, the, the expression that gets thrown around a lot of religion is the opiate of the masses is, is misinterpreted a great deal of the time. And I'm going to riff a little bit on Kurt Vonnegut here, but Kurt Vonnegut had a much more insightful uh, interpretation of it because he said his, his interpretation wasn't it's the opiate of the masses because religion gets people high. Mr. Vonnegut's interpretation was it's the opiate of the masses because it makes the existence, the pain of existence less. And as long as you're not hurting anybody, fill your boots. Mr. Vonnegut was a humanist. I subscribe to the very, very similar approach when it comes to the question of religion. Believe in whatever you want. If it makes life easier for you, if it gives you purpose, if it lessens the pain of existence, fill your boots. But it's your choice. It shouldn't be anybody else's choice. It's certainly not a choice that should be forced on anyone else. And I have, as I've seen, as I said a minute ago, I haven't seen a compelling argument that that individual choice should be subsidized by everybody else who maybe doesn't share that belief or who even does. Because when you have governments that have religious bents, that tends to create a lot of problems historically. Moving on from there. I just want to say, before we get into this topic, and I am as cisgendered, straight, middle-aged white guy as it gets. I've owned that on the show many times. I will continue to do so because I think it's important that I say it, and I think it's important that people hear it. But the way the Daniel Smith and the UCP have committed to punching down on vulnerable youth. I'm just so done with it. And I'm not done with it in the sense of, and therefore I'm going to stop speaking out about it because obviously we're about to do a whole segment on it. But I'm done with the fact that Daniel Smith and the UCP are comfortable punching down. I'm done with the fact that Daniel Smith and the UCP are comfortable gaslighting Albertans, that they're comfortable emotionally manipulating Albertans. So yeah, we're here now to talk about Daniel Smith's latest announcement, not made via press conference, where she might have to answer some questions, where she might have to deal with some potential accountability. Not with that. The new thing that the Premier of Alberta likes to do is issue sweeping edicts by pre-recorded videos where she has all of the chances that she needs to get the language and the tone exactly right, where she can read off of a teleprompter unchallenged, where she's not going to be asked any questions about why she's continuing to pursue a policy that experts across the board have said is going to create harm. This is how we do things in Alberta now with the, the, the Daniel Smith model of communications. And it's quite frankly beneath Albertans. But she did it. So we got to talk about it. And we're going to start by talking about how she introduced the language of the new policies. 
complex and often deeply emotional topics. As someone who personally understands the profound impact and challenges these issues can cause children and their families, I want to make it clear that our government is here to support and uplift every child and every family of a child who identifies as transgender or who is struggling with gender dysphoria. And more specifically to those children and youth, I want you to know that you are loved. I care deeply about each of you and you are valued as much as anyone else in our province and in our communities. I am absolutely committed to ensuring that you receive the support you and your family may need during this critical time of growth and self-discovery. I also want you to know that I and those who serve with me in our government are bringing in these new rules for only one purpose. We believe it's vitally important to preserve the time you have as a youth to gain sufficient amount of knowledge, experience, and perspective so that you can fully understand who you are, who you want to be, and what opportunities you may want to have as an adult before making permanent life-altering decisions related to your body. That is so very important to understand. And anyone who claims that these rules were designed to target or somehow harm you in any way are mistaken. Although questioning or disagreeing with these new policies is any person's democratic right, adults who choose to tell children and youth that these policies were designed to hurt them or marginalize them, that kind of rhetoric is irresponsible and harmful to the young people involved, and it is entirely false. I sincerely hope that we adults can debate the proposed legislation with maturity and compassion, rather than question each other's motives at the expense of the children and youth who will be listening to the debate. Now that's some next level bullshit. And that's some next level bullshit for a bunch of reasons. And I probably should at this point say um, there may be profanity as we work our way through this, because what Daniel Smith is doing in that chunk of video is she's trying to say, she's trying to speak directly to the kids. Hey, you know what? You know, I'm just trying to preserve your your childhood. I'm going to completely ignore the fact that if you're dealing with something like gender dysphoria, that 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 affects you on the on the daily, and that getting treatment for that under the appropriate medical supervision would make your life better. It would give you a much better quality of life. It would it would improve so many different things for you. I'm just going to ignore that entirely. And what I'm going to say is, you know, we just want you to just sit with all of that. Just sit and wait until not a pediatrician, not an endocrinologist, not a specialist of any kind, but a political hack who will, as we just demonstrated in earlier segments, lie to people. She's trying to weaponize the kids now. By saying to the kids, hey, anybody who says that these policies are about anything other than just loving and protecting on you so hard, they're just trying to hurt you. They're hurting the argument. That is some next level, craven, devious bullshit, period. You want to talk about divisive rhetoric? You're saying to the kids that anybody who says to the kids, hey, this is some this is some pretty fucked up stuff that we're trying to navigate here. And I'm so sorry that the premier of Alberta has decided that with her no background in psychology or medicine or anything else that's pertinent other than her personal experience. I'm sorry that this is what's happening to you. I'm sorry that she's doing these things against the better advice of all of the experts. Against the Alberta section of pediatrics, against the Alberta Medical Association, against the Canadian Medical Association. Against all of these people, I'm sorry that she believes that she just knows better. And since she put it on the table it's time to have part of the conversation that a lot of us have been dancing around for far too long. And I'm going to get some trouble for this. Danielle Smith has made it clear that the most important thing in this whole conversation for her is to make sure that kids don't lose the ability... Not that they do. They don't lose the ability to have kids. And at a certain point, we have to ask the question, how much of this is personal bias? 
It's well documented that Daniel Smith is unable to have children. And that is tragic. And that is sad. But the fact that she is pursuing policies that go so far against the science and the medicine and the experts, the fact that the consultation that she did for this program was purely performative and only in how should we implement these policies, not should we implement these policies. The consultation was, how do we find the doctors who are going to try to do this stuff anyways? How should we penalize them? It wasn't, are these policies sound? Are they evidence-based? Are they going to do more harm? And as we discussed on last week's episode, introducing legislation, politicizing the conversations that should be happening in doctor's offices increases the risk of suicide for trans youth by up to 72%. And I'm sorry, I just can't have this conversation anymore without bringing up the fact that there should be a question asked, is this all just because Danny can't have kids? I have had so many conversations with so many people since she rolled these policies out saying that I could not go there. 72%. She is bringing forward policies that are going to kill kids. She is doing it in the face of all available expertise and evidence. And she's not as much as she's trying to say there. Hey, kids, come meet me over at camera two. I'm doing this for you. At this point in the conversation, I think it is only fair to ask, is this not being in any way driven by your own personal trauma? And if it is, is it maybe time to take a step back? Because the pursuit of just pursuing the reproductive viability of human beings who are dealing with a diagnosable condition is, it should be beneath all of us. But she doesn't even care that it's going to put kids at risk. That's not, again, the concern. She spent the whole introduction saying, hey, you know what, kids, we're just trying to protect you. We're just trying to make it about you. But as she says later in the video, that's so clearly not the case. Circumstances where a teacher feels that a child might be at risk should the parents be notified of a desired name or pronoun change. Alberta Education will provide a protocol to ensure the protection of that child throughout the parental notification process. So even if... The teachers have reason to believe that the kids are, that kid, if you go to their parents, that kid has somehow expressed to the teacher in a substantial way, I really don't want my parents to know about this. I'm afraid of what might happen. I'm afraid I'll be at risk. And it's important to lean into the premier's own language here because she's not saying, well, the parents might be unhappy. Mm, might be an awkward conversation. She's saying if the teachers believe that the kids are at risk, the notification will still happen, but there will be some kind of protocol. It's not defined. And it doesn't change the fact that that kid will still be at risk. So it's not about protecting the kids. What this is about at its core is protecting the reproductive viability of those, these kids because a human being's only value is, is a baby factory. It's about protecting the insecurities and the control issues of homophobic and transphobic parents. Period. These policies are being rolled out because that's who her base is. And these policies are being rolled out at the time that they are 
because she wanted a long enough run up to be able to do some faux consultation, which again, we foiped. We know exactly what the point of that consultation was. It was purely to ask the question, how do we implement these policies? She wants to survive her leadership review and she doesn't care how many other kids don't. And she leans into it in the video, too. She got right into the guilt side. Sincerely ask that as we discuss and debate this proposed legislation, both before and after it is tabled, that we do all we can to depoliticize the discussion and focus on the well-being of the children and youth most affected by these policies. They each need to know that although adults may strenuously disagree on what policies are in a child's best interest, each of us loves and supports them in becoming the person they want to be regardless and will be there for them if they ever want to talk or need our support. That commitment and care by all of us for these children and youth should not be questioned by either side of a political debate. Fuck you, Danny. And I say that because this was not politicized until you decided that you literally wanted to make policies to politicize it. This is a conversation that should only be happening in doctor's offices. This is a conversation that should be happening with the person who's experiencing the gender dysphoria. This is a conversation that should be happening with the appropriate medical and psychological supports. And ideally, if the parents are supportive and involved and engaged and they have made their own child feel safe to have that conversation with them, which I would just like to reiterate is such a painfully low bar to have to attain. You pulled it out of those offices. You decided that you needed to make policies and do a whole PR campaign about it. Not because it's the right thing to do, because all of the evidence says very clearly the contrary. But because this is a policy that's in the same vein as the conspiracy theories, like the chemtrails. And you don't care who it's going to hurt. It's all about just making the policy happen in whatever form is going to make it the least likely to be legally challenged. How do I know? Because there was one other clip from that Edmonton town hall that we haven't played yet. As a child, in Alberta, we don't allow children to drink, smoke, or vote under 18. But a child under that age is now going to be allowed life-altering surgery transitioning. Please advise why this position has changed, especially in the face of such an aggressive campaign against the innocence of our children. Look, I mean, <laughs> what, what we have to do in government is, is do the possible and make sure that our legislation doesn't get struck down. And there is lots of, of jurisprudence that says that at some point along a child's development, they get the right to make their own decisions. And when it comes to healthcare, that age is somewhere around um, 15, 16 years old. You can be emancipated from your parents at age 16. You actually can apply to the court to, uh, to be independent from your parents. And so that's part of the reason why we said 15 and under, um, you cannot make these decisions without your uh, parental in in involvement in decisions even to start social transitioning. And we're just not going to allow puberty blockers or surgery. Uh, we're not going to allow surgery under the age of 18 because that's, that's life altering. But the, um, the, the, uh, the medications uh, that uh, we just believe that we'll, uh, we'll end up having a lot of legal challenges. It's, it's pretty difficult when so much, so many legal judgments have been made that kids can go on birth control, they can have babies, they can emancipate themselves from their parents at 16. It'd be pretty hard for us to say, sorry, you're not going to be able to be allowed to do this at 16 and 17. So we thought 16 was the right age to at least allow that to begin, but they still won't be able to take surgeries until they're 18 or over. It's all about what you can get past. Doesn't matter what the evidence is. Doesn't matter that how many people have pointed out 
that the puberty blockers are pointless for most kids after age 16 because most kids are already well into puberty at that point and defeats the point of the drug. doesn't matter. What matters is passing the legislation in such a way that they can declare it a win so she can throw this red meat to her base. And that's all it is. And it's for that reason that we saw Amnesty International call out the province of Alberta again. This happens too much. We get called out by Amnesty International way, way, way too much. But Amnesty International issued a statement where they said Amnesty International joins EGAL Canada, uh, Momentum, and two SLGBTQQIA plus communities in strongly condemning these policy measures. These changes not only violate the constitutional rights of two SLGBTQQIA plus people, but also pose inherent harm by perpetuating existing stereotypes, discrimination, stigmatization, and exclusion. What Premier Dania, what Premier Smith and the Alberta government is are proposing is, in a word, appalling, said Ketty Nivia Bandi, uh, Secretary General of Amnesty International's Canadian English speaking section. Trans Albertans, uh, including trans children and youth, have a right to compassionate and distinctions based gender affirming care, full stop. The potential long term impacts of these policy changes on the health and well being of 2S LGBTQQIA youth and communities are dire. But it's just about the kids, right? It's not like we're seeing major shifts in government policy that specifically exclude uh, trans folks in any way. It's not like, I don't know, as guest of the show and delightful human being for the record, Marnie Pan has pointed out, literally just uh, yesterday, the scholarship to advance gender equity, the person's case scholarship. This is it's literally called person's case scholarship. I'm laughing because this is so painful. Person's case scholarship. In order to be eligible, you have to identify as a man or a woman. What is the point of the person's case scholarship? It supports women and men studying in the arts, humanities, and social science fields whose work advances gender equality and who are studying in fields where their gender is underrepresented and disadvantaged. You have to identify clearly as a woman or man. It's, I mean, it's so clear. It's so abundantly clear what's going on here. It's, mind-blowing that there's anybody who's denying it anymore this is about i like things simple i like my men to be men i like my women to be women i don't want any confusing stuff in regards to what's going on in another person's pants even though it's none of my goddamn business to be concerned about what's in their pants anyways i am so tired of the conflation that exists that somebody who is non-binary somehow also equals predator because it's simply not true there's no reason to know what plumbing a person has unless you're the physician or part of the medical team that's managing their care or one of their intimate partners after that it doesn't matter But it's all about catering to those insecurities. It's all about catering to those, those fears. It's not in any way about leadership. You know what the crazy part is? We're only halfway. <laughs> uh, Alberta Paul, I remember I went back a little while ago. We're doing a little aside here as a, as a slight break from all of that. I remember a little while ago, I went back, I looked at the first episode of the breakdown that we ever did. I think it was 20 minutes. <laughs> and we thought we were hitting all of the content of like the month. That's, that's, that's where we are now. Moving on from there and starting to step into the next sort of segment, the chunk of the show. 
We're going to talk about the victim services changes. October 1st marked the, the, the first major change, um, the implementation of the Alberta UCP's new victim services model. Now, the UCP claims that it's to improve stability, consistency, and sustainability of police-based victim services. But what they've done is they've ended all funding to all of the RCMP-based victim services units in Alberta. They're, now, they're doing four regional ones instead. So they're, they're going to have offices in Western, Eastern, Central, and Southern, and those centralized centralized um, departments are going to, to run the victim services. But uh, there's a lot of people who are very unhappy about this with a lot of good reasons. And there's two big pieces with this story that we got we got to kind of parse out. The first one is, why are people unhappy? Well, from the story that we have on the screen right now, um, Paul McLaughlin, president of Rural Municipalities of Alberta and the Reeve of Pinoca County, says his area isn't receiving the same level of service. He notes that the town of Rimby, which is located within Pinoca County, used to have a full-time person dedicated to victim services, but says that's no longer the case as the position has been reduced to half-time under the new model. Full-time equivalents are increasing, but the number of full-time equivalents that actually have interaction with people that are the victims of crime or dealing with tragedy in their community, those are decreasing. So the same government that said, oh, there's too many managers, there's not enough front-facing staff with AHS, have just created a model. This, for the record, is me editorializing, not uh, Paul McLaughlin. Um, have just created a model where the it's bureaucracy-heavy and people are actually losing frontline resources from the same story former three hills victim service program manager carolyn kung agrees that the change to the regional model puts proper care levels at risk because of that people will suffer she said um that's one thing about if you had a volunteer board who just fundraised to make sure that we had a full-time person in those kinds of places now we don't have that we've got somebody who's in charge of the program managers and they're basically overseeing it also the program is costing a lot more money and they're not having volunteers in each program uh, that were passionate about what their communities are doing anymore. So it seems like everybody's losing in this one, which isn't great. So you have to ask yourself, well, why are we doing this thing? Well, let's take a look at what's actually mechanically happening. The province of Alberta has pulled the funding for the victim services stuff away from the RCMP. So this goes back to the whole debate and conversation around policing in the province of Alberta. Daniel Smith has made it very, very clear that she wants to, she's going to go out of her way to, to denigrate the work that the RCMP do. When she was at that same municipality's conference, she gave inaccurate, incorrect numbers and was called out for it. But what did she actually say about the RCMP? that Alberta has two provincial police forces? Yep. Are you referring to RCMP and sheriff? I was. How does that make sense? Does that not add more cost, red tape, bureaucracy to managing two concurrent provincial police forces? Well, we've got um, the city of Edmonton and city of Calgary, each have their police force, as does Tabor, and so does Lacombe, and so does Medicine Hat, and Grand Prairie will soon. I, I think that uh, that demonstrates that having different options for different communities makes sense. Um, the reason we're doing it is because the RCMP has not been able to fill the need that we have. We pay for 1,911 officers, and they have four or 500 vacancies. And we cannot allow for municipal or for rural communities to be under policed. And so we have um, uh, trained up our sheriffs to a point where they have the same training as police so that they can do more work in, um, in being able to operate across the different police forces. As I mentioned in my, in my talk, um, they already do surveillance has for some time. They, um, they, our scan team shuts down drug houses and we're regularly seeing um, results from that. Our uh, fugitive apprehension team has been extraordinarily successful. 3,000 executed warrants and 350 really bad dudes being captured and kept um, in uh, incarcerated. And so we've been, we've rolled out a similar team of seven in Calgary to be able to help down there. Um, our highway patrol 
I mean, as uh, if you talk to any high patrol officer, they say that one thing is consistent, that bad guys need a getaway and they're using our roads. And so that's one of the ways in which you have to, in which we apprehend criminals. So I would say I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the work of our, of our sheriffs. And when Mike Ellis came in, he was actually surprised that uh, there was so little additional training that we needed to be able to get them up to the same standard as police. So we just want to give more options. And I think that's better. Now, there's a lot to unpack here because now all of a sudden Alberta has two provincial police forces. She considers the sheriffs to be another provincial police force. Secondary to that, she's saying that if municipalities don't want to go with the RCMP and they don't want to go with building their own police force for themselves, they can get a sheriff's detachment, which is a lot. Um the numbers are all wrong. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> all of the numbers that she gave there are, are pretty much wrong. But here's how wrong you have to be. This is every once in a while we get a DM and we're like, whoa, what happened there? Um, and this was one of the DMs. And we've confirmed that this is this is who we're going to say it is. This DM came from somebody who is literally inside the sheriff's department. Danielle Smith, we were shocked at how little training it took to get them up to speed. They're at the same speed as the RCMP now. Mike Ellis, shocked. Mike Ellis, a former Calgary police officer, by the way. Do with that what you will. Um, Mike Ellis, shocked at how little training there was. The call literally came from inside the sheriff's house. Because we got this uh, this DM. Surprising little training. There hasn't been any training yet. The sheriffs are still police op peace officers, not police. A group has been seconded off working on what this upgraded course might look like, which is to get approved by the director of law enforcement. And the estimates I've seen are 8 to 12 weeks. Sheriff normally gets 16 weeks to be peace officers. And police services normally take 28 weeks to do their curriculum. So 8 to 12 weeks. Four, three to four. Sorry. Two to three extra months of training to upgrade is in line with that. Also, there isn't any capacity to any current training academy to put a thousand sheriffs through an eight to 12 week class with the bodies to backfill those vacancies while people are away training. That was sent to us by a sheriff. <laughs> but this is where the 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 conversation gets so um biggish um but it's not the only place that daniel smith mentioned the the sheriffs in the last last week uh, sheriffs and the numbers the rcmp having some issue with the numbers that you quoted um your response to that i mean they're saying that uh i think you said it was 1900 rcmp with 400 vacancy, something like that. And they said, no, no, it's 1,700 and 324 or, or whatever the numbers were. What's, what's the reason for the discrepancy? Well, they do have uh, folks who are on leave. So we've got vacancies because they haven't been able to fill them. And then we've got vacancies because we've got people on leave for various reasons. And in, in typical practice, when somebody goes on leave, you find a temporary replacement for them. So we still have 400 vacancies, regardless of the reason why those aren't being filled, and that's a problem. And so when what we know and what we heard when we did our, our rural consultation is uh, people don't care what color of uniform uh, a, an officer uh, is wearing when they show up, whether it's a municipal officer um, or a sheriff or an RCMP officer. They just want someone to show up when they call. And um, it's, it's quite clear to us that the RCMP is having recruitment troubles, and so we are continuing to offer to municipalities um, research uh, grants so that they can see if they want to shore up their policing services a different way. Uh, Grand Prairie took us up on that, and they're shifting from an RCMP to a local municipal force, just like Calgary and Edmonton have. And we're hearing that others want to have a sheriff's detachment. So that's where we're going, is we're, we're going to make sure that there's all kinds of options for, for, um, for those, especially those in rural Alberta, so that they're policed properly. But not all municipalities are on board. Well, look, I mean, if you ask Calgary and Edmonton, would you like to collapse your police service and go back to the RCMP? I'd, I'd be interested in knowing that answer. They'd probably say no. I'm asking the communities that are policed by the RCMP, 
whether they're happy with the service they're getting. And if they're not, uh, we're prepared to help them uh, move to a municipal force, just like Calgary and Edmonton have, or to uh, to even set up a sheriff's detachment. So I, I'm I'm not, uh, if they want to keep their RCMP, they will. If they want to try something else, we'll support them in that. See, now there's some things that we need to tease out of there. First of all, that's a trap. And it's a trap because, as a certain municipality in southern Alberta learned, if you have the RCMP and you then go, which, by the way, a significant amount of federal funding pays for the RCMP to be in that community. If you then go, ah, you know what? Ah, we don't like the RCMP anymore. We're going to go with with the the sheriffs or Timmy's policing or whatever. I don't care. Um you lose that funding. You don't get access to that funding back. You can't just flip a switch and go back to the RCMP. If you do, you'll be paying the full price. So to say, hey, communities, if you want to give something else a try, we fully support you in that. Uh, it's going to totally screw your tax base going forward, but that's okay because we'll swoop in with the sheriffs. But there's another little piece there that that and I know we played that clip last week, but I really wanted to play it again because there's another little piece there. Because if you have somebody, ah, you know, we got to have the frontline people making sure the frontline people, they're on the streets, they're doing the things. I just want to go back to that message we got from the sheriff. Um, a, a group has been seconded off working on what the upgrading course might look like. So even the sheriffs when necessary, move people off of the frontline roles to go do the other things. So just because somebody's been seconded off to do something doesn't necessarily mean there's a vacancy. It just means that the greater system is is maneuvering itself to cover so they can do some of the other things. But even the sheriffs do it. So that was wildly entertaining to me. But what are we talking about here? What's the what's the broad strokes? What's the goal? And this is where, again, we have to talk about the free Alberta strategy. For anybody who's been un- unfamiliar, we, we talked about it for like a long time. And then we didn't talk about it for a while. And then when we talked about it like two weeks ago, everybody was like, wait, what's that? So we're going to we're going to talk about it again. Uh, free Alberta strategy. Short version. It's a, a document. Uh, written by Rob Anderson, who's now Daniel Smith's right-hand executive puppet ma- I mean director. Um, we've got uh, Barry Cooper, long-time Alberta sovereignist, Alberta separatist. We've got Derek Fromm, who was Daniel Smith's lawyer during her whole leadership campaign. Um, they, they wrote this, this document, and it's got some pretty clear goals. And when you take a look at the policy agenda that we've seen from Daniel Smith in the UCP under all of these things, some of these long term goals start to make sense. We've got the Alberta Sovereignty Act. Check one. We've got the Alberta Provincial Police Force. Check two. We've got the Independent Banking Act which is an act designed to move more people to things like the Alberta Treasury Branch and credit unions. And here's Danielle Smith talking about the fact that she wants to bring in uh, Sharia law compliant halal mortgages to the Alberta Treasury Branch, allegedly. Um, We have the Equalization, Termination and Tax Collection Act. So Daniel Smith wants to, the, the Free Alberta Strategy, sorry, is advocating for more centralized tax collection through the province of Alberta. We should collect our own taxes. Cough, cough. Uh, didn't we just talk about that again at the municipalities? Oh, we did. Oh, look, we've got the Alberta pension plan. Uh, there's a couple of other points, but the big thing to take away is the final resort. I love that they called it the final resort. The Republic of Western Canada, the democratic independent process. So the free Alberta strategy is all about positioning Alberta in such a way that it would be able to separate from Canada. Don't believe me? Let's go directly to the document just for uh, ease of, of reference here. So what does the free Alberta strategy actually have to say when it comes to separatism? In the event that Ottawa refuses to recognize Alberta's provincial rights of sovereignty and instead continues its strategic or its strategy of economic tyranny, co-opted management of our resource sector and the marginalization of our citizens and may leave our province with no other recourse but to leave confederation entirely. Although national independence is a path of least resort, living under the rule of a cabal of eastern political elites that Albertans have not and will never elect and whose goals and agenda mean economic and societal devastation for our people cannot possibly be an option worth entertaining. An ancillary feature 
bonus feature of the Free Alberta Strategy is that it will better prepare Alberta for national political sovereignty should it become necessary. It also, you know, rana, rana, rana. It also involves a great expansion of our provincial reg regulated financial institutions and intermediate government affairs, which will be naturally required should independence become the only viable option for the province. In short, it sets Alberta up for independence in the event that independence must be considered. So let's be crystal clear here. We got a roadmap of the legislative agenda of Daniel Smith's UCP. We can look at all of the major policy initiatives that Daniel Smith's UCP have pursued. Free Alberta strategy, the Alberta pension plan, the Alberta police. All of this stems from a document that was written by her executive director not 10 years ago, not 20 years ago. It was written in September of 2021. This document is three years old. It was released in the run-up to Danielle Smith's leadership run. At a certain point, it becomes irresponsible to not ask the question, hey, is there maybe something going on here? Because it seems like the policy agenda that Daniel Smith is pursuing is one that sets Alberta up for separation, which again is such a dumb idea for so many reasons, not the least of which is that Alberta exists at a, as a province because of the crown. And the crown has treaties with all of the First Nations and Indigenous peoples who literally, it covers every square inch of Alberta. All of the treaties do. And I've said it before on the show, I'll say it again, in order for Alberta to leave Canada, they would have to convince all of the First Nations and Indigenous peoples who, I don't know, maybe have a little bit of a history of getting screwed, that this time, this time, you can trust the white folks because depending on the day, Danielle Smith does say that she's either Cherokee or Métis, so it'll be fine. But this is the agenda that Daniel Smith is wittingly or unwittingly pursuing. Which brings us, oh dear, which brings us to Adriana. Adriana had herself a bit of a week, she did. Um, didn't go great for, 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 for Adriana this week. It was, it was not... It was not smooth. Um, so let's start with the, 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 <laughs> it's just such a perfect clip. She, Adriana LaGrange went to Hinton, Alberta, and she went to Hinton, Alberta to announce the, the, the fixing of, of rural health care. And she was doing that by announcing three sets of numbers. One of those sets of numbers was for a program to keep physicians in rural Alberta. One of them was to initiate training for medical first responders, which are basically if you want to fill the space between like that first aid CPR course that you did that one time when you were going to be a counselor at camp uh, and paramedics, that, that's where the medical first responders would would sit. They're good to have if you don't have a paramedic, but. Let's be very, very clear. They're not they're not paramedics. And that's not me being elitist because most medical first responders are also volunteer firefighters. And they will be happy to tell you that they love it when the paramedics show up on calls because there's a much bigger toolbox to play with. But she had to announce those three programs with the three numbers that were attached to them. It did not go well. Money is in play for the two year bursary and the three-year program um, the two-year bursary okay I need, I need the my binder in front of me <laughs> i know it's eight million for the let me just get it so i give you the exact numbers here um it is should i have that right at my fingertips here
too many pieces of paper, but let me get that for you. Oh, okay, thank you. We'll, we'll get that we'll information follow up. over. Yeah, the eight million over two years is for the qualified medical students, so that's the bursary program. Is the eight million over two years, and for the medical first responders grant, it's eight hundred thousand uh, for the grant program, and then six hundred thousand for the emerging uh, emergency medical responder education grant. My favorite part about that clip, other than how exquisitely painful it is. My favorite part about that clip is watching the MLA to LaGrange's left. The The gentleman on the right is the mayor of Hinton, but the, the gentleman on the left is, is another UCP MLA. And just watching him intermittently lurch forward as if he could somehow stop the car crash that's unfolding in front of him is just, that's, that's my, my, my favorite, favorite part of that, that whole bit. Um, but, the the AMA, the Alberta Medical Association, they issued a bit of a response to the announcement of the new funding to retain physicians, and it wasn't it wasn't great. Uh, the minister's announcement today on future training on training future physicians in rural areas where they live is not a new strategy. The strategy has been used since the late 1990s to increase the number of rural physicians in the province. Alberta universities offer medical student and resident rural training programs through which learners study with practicing physicians. There are even number of specific published studies that explain why these programs have not always been successful and what government has to do to sustain the traction of the program. So saying this announcement will revitalize rural health care is an exaggeration. Additional support and funding for rural medicine are always appreciated, but the minister's announcement fails to address the parallel and accelerating crises Albertans are facing. One, in rural generalist and family medicine, and two, in our acute care system. Goes on to say uh, a bunch more. Um, and uh, there was, a, there was a, another question that, that came up, which we're going we're gonna to talk about in just a sec here. But first, because only in Alberta. <laughs> um, Hinton has had a bit of a problem uh, keeping their emergency room open because of the, uh, the, the shortage of physicians that they've been experiencing. Um, and it, it's just the absolute chef's kiss that Adriana LaGrange went to Hinton to announce, hey, we're going to fix rural health care the day after a closure of the emergency room, but also with a closure happening immediately after she left. So revitalizing and stuff, I guess. But she also made an announcement while she was there in regards to the, the question of vaccine availability. And this gets to be real important as we, we head, to, head towards the home stretch of all of the topics before we get into the, the FOIP. Family doctors, especially here in Calgary, say that they have not received any flu vaccines or COVID vaccines this fall. Uh, last year, they had received the, the flu vaccine at this point, and a lot of seniors uh, have been wondering where they need to go to get these vaccines. So why is that the case? Why are these vaccines not being delivered in a timely manner? And what is your ministry doing about that to, to fix this? Well, this falls in under the purview of the federal government. So the federal government are the ones that uh, approve uh, through Health Canada the vaccines for any particular year. Uh, they'll approve a, a particular vaccine for a particular strain of flu, et cetera, uh, for COVID, RSV, et cetera. Uh, we are awaiting that um, finalization. And then they are also the ones that procure en masse for the whole country. And my understanding is we are on track to receive our vaccines by October 15th, which is next week, um, or shortly thereafter. I think we're the third, so within 12 days. Um, my understanding that we are still on track, but it, it, this does fall within the purview of uh, Health Canada, and we continue to advocate to make sure that we get the vaccine quantity um, and in a timely fashion from the federal government. Now, there's a communication strategy that a lot of people say uh, politicians should utilize. And that strategy is 
answer the question that you wish you were asked, not the question that you were asked. And that can work with a pivot. It can work if you qualify. That's a really good question, Tim. I'd love to talk about why the vaccines aren't specifically available in the, uh, they're gonna, why they're specifically not going to be available in doctor's offices. But I think better, the better question, the bigger question would be, why is the federal government digging so long? Right, 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 right. If you do that qualifier, then you can get away with it. It's gross, but you can get away with it. If you don't do that qualifier, then it's just misleading. And as we saw in a story that came from CBC News on October 4th, LaGrange's answer appears to be just misleading. Also, before I move on, I got to give props to Disordered YYC for that clip um, because they're the ones who clipped it and they're awesome. You should go follow them on Twitter right now. Uh, in the story from CBC, they talk about a memo that says the distribution of provincially funded vaccines to medical and nurse practitioner clinics was temporarily paused in April when a contract with the distribution company expired. At this time, Alberta Health has not been successful in contracting a distributor to ship vaccines to community medical and nurse practitioner clinics, it stated. It went on to say a recent expression of interest had closed and no submissions were received. Now, where it gets complicated, though, is CBC actually reached out to the company that used to do it. From the story again, CBC News reached out to Acuristics, the company that had been contracted to distribute the vaccines. In an email, the company said Alberta Health elected not to renew its contract. Our contract was not renewed, but we were pleased to help AHS with the physician distribution and hope to hear from them, said Dean Berg, president of the healthcare logistics company. A spokesperson for Alberta Health said the contract was not renewed because it term, its term had expired, which is a wild sentence to read out loud because isn't that why you would renew it? Because it had expired? If the contract was in effect, would it need to be renewed? So at the end of the day, what's happened with the, the vaccines in the province of Alberta is they have centralized the distribution channels. You're going to have to go to the, the public health clinics or you're going to have to go to a drug store like Shoppers Drug Mart um, who are then going to be able to profit off of the administration of that vaccine. One of the big things that has been identified and it, you know, if only we'd had a recent um, uh, real world example of a, a public health problem that we could have learned from, if only something like that had recently happened where we could have learned that when you want uptake on things, one of the biggest things that you have to do is reduce barriers to entry. So if physicians have the vaccines in their clinics and somebody comes in for their routine whatever, or they want to talk about that ingrown whatever, um, the physician can say, hey, while you're here, would you like a vaccine? And then the person can go, oh yeah, that would totally save me a trip. I would love to do that. Yes, please. Please give me the vaccine. Or they can say no. That's up to them too. Um, get vaccinated. But it's up to them too. Um, this is a deliberate creation of barrier to entry. It's also worth noting that it de decreases yet another potential revenue stream for family physicians. Because family physicians would be able to bill in the same way that shoppers Drug Mart would. Shoppers Drug Mart or any of the other major pharmacies aren't dealing with um, failing bottom lines that are seeing 58% of Shoppers Drug Marts or London Drug Marts uh, going out of business and leaving the province. That is the reality of what we're seeing in family medicine right now, though. So it's kind of a deliberate move. And it's dangerous because it also adds to the perception. And again, I want to be really clear. I'm not dunking on pharmacists. I love my pharmacists. Um, they're fantastic. And they have helped me and my family in many ways. But 
I would not go to a pharmacist for a whole lot of diagnostic stuff. And I say that not only as a, as a husband and a parent, but I also say that as a, somebody who works in healthcare. Um, and my views in no way represent my employer. Uh, so you, you, one of the things that you learn is it's best to go to the people who are good at doing the things. So pharmacists absolutely have a role in the primary health, primary care network, but they are not the primary care network and they shouldn't be talked about like they're the primary care network. This furthers that perception that your pharmacist can be your one-stop shop for all things healthcare. And they're not, they're just not. And that's not me denigrating pharmacists. That's just me saying the reality of the situation. Moving on from there. I'm going to take a long sip for this segment. The moment, one of them that you've all been waiting for. Um, after an hour and 40 minutes. I'm so sorry. Um, we got to talk about, uh, we're going to bring back one of our segments that we haven't had in a while. Bring it back. Are you foiping kidding me? Because one of the things that we've been quietly doing for the last few months is uh, we've been filing some FOIPs. And we've been filing some FOIPs because we have been trying to make sense out of this. This picture. There is so much going on in this picture. And we talked about it, I think, back in July or August. Because we started looking into things and we were like, oh, this is this seems... Oh boy, there's so much going on here. We need we need the grown-ups because the farther that you go down the rabbit hole, the more ridiculous and quite frankly dangerous it gets. So we 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 handed off everything that we had to the to the to the grown-ups. Um but that didn't mean that we stopped digging. And it didn't mean that we stopped talking about the things that uh, we're doing inquiries as such. And so we did, uh, we've been doing a series of FOIPs and we have some more results that we'd like to share. Now, before we do, I want to just put the, the picture up on the, the big screen here, because this is, again, from the semifinals game in Vancouver that Danielle Smith flew out to with at least one staffer. We know at least one staffer because you can see Rebecca Bullock sitting right beside Danielle Smith there. It's a bunch of other people in the picture. You can see Dave Aby and his family. Uh, he was invited by Danielle Smith. So the story so far has been that Danielle Smith was gifted the, the skybox seats by a private citizen, which is a fascinating term to use because that private citizen is actually somebody that she had appointed to the board of Invest Alberta just a few months prior. So, eh, private citizen slash very wealthy employee, do with that what you will. Eh, a lot, a lot of questions there. Uh, but there's also a lot of faces in that, uh, that, that photo that are quite familiar. We're going to, not tonight, we're not going to unpack it all the way tonight, uh, but we're going to be unpacking that in two weeks. We'll talk about that in a little bit, because tonight we're here to just talk about one thing. Because as I said, if you look at that picture, you can see there's Becca Pollack right there, uh, Daniel Smith sitting there. Uh, who all went? Who all went to the game? We'd, like, we'd love to know. There was some, some vague reporting, um, by no fault of the reporters, to be clear, because the premier's office was being deliberately opaque in regards to what went on in order to a get that skybox and b get all of the people in that skybox. Now we wanted to know who went, how to work. So we filed a FOIP. And what our FOIP the question of the FOIP was, seeking all records as defined by Section 1Q of the Act related to which staffers accompanied Premier Daniel Smith at any NHL games the Premier attended from May 3rd to June 25th, 2024, including out-of-province uh, or out-of-country games and in what capacity they staffed her. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting because we got some results back. What's interesting is Daniel Smith is already on the record 
saying that she accepted gifts from the Edmonton Oilers of sk- tickets to games in Edmonton. Danielle Smith has claimed that one of the biggest reasons why she needed to make the changes that she made to the conflict of interest laws and policies, regulations for staffers, was because it was so critically important that she was staffed at these events. But here's the thing. We only got the results back for one game. It almost seems as if Daniel Smith was not staffed by any staffers in any kind of an official capacity for the two playoff games that she attended at Edmonton, which is fascinating because, again, she, the whole reason why she needed to make the changes was so that she could be staffed at these events. But there's no record of any staff having staffed her at any of the other two events. What there are, though, is a couple of very interesting records in regards to who staffed her at uh, the Vancouver event. Now, before we share all of this, I just want to highlight again, no matter how you cut it, for Becca Polak and Marshall Smith to attend that game was a violation of the regulations that exist for staffers because those tickets were absolutely worth more than $500. And if they accepted them in the, 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 the course of doing their official staffing duties, that needs to be approved by Marshall Smith. If they accepted them outside of their official duties, that would be a violation of those regulations. So no matter, of, no matter what, we can safely say with a high level of confidence that whichever staffers attended violated the conflict of interest regulations for staffers. So what happened? Let's take a look. One of the results that we got back comes from May 6th, 2024, 5.05 p.m. It was sent by Jeanette Lee, who is the Mission and Visits Coordinator. Here you go, James. I've booked all of the six rooms. James then passes that on to a number of people. Uh, One of them is Elliot Hool, who is the Director of Tour Office of the Premier. Another one is Catherine Stavrop, Stavropol. Uh, I'm so sorry, Catherine. Um, she's the executive assistant to Premier and Tour Coordination. It also went to Terry Stelmack, which is, and this is as a, as a fun little aside, one of the fun things about the FOIPs that we do is every once in a while you find a little, it's a little Easter egg that you find in the story. It turns out that, uh, that Terry Stelmack is not just the sergeant performing the role of operational support coordinator for the sheriffs. He's actually Ed Stelmack's son. He's been doing the job for, for 20 years. Didn't know that before we filed the FWIPE. So there's your, your one little piece of absolutely harmless, but maybe interesting if you're a political geek, information. Um, Shauna and Jill. James Fisher forwarded that on to Shauna Shepard and Jill Black. Shauna Shepard, worth noting, is the executive assistant to Marshall Smith from the Vancouver downtown hotel the Marriott. Both of these emails that James Fisher percolated down went to Marshall Smith and Becca Pollock specifically regarding their bookings. So Marshall Smith and Becca Pollock were confirmed to have stayed at a hotel paid for by the taxpayers for this trip, which they went on their personal time. $532.17 each. So these are two separate hotel reservation confirmations. So what we have so far is the apparatus of the government of Alberta booked hotel rooms for six people. Two of them are confirmed to be staffers. It's safe to assume one of the other ones was Daniel Smith. And given that and the involvement of Terry Stelmack, uh, it's also probably safe to assume that the other three are Daniel Smith's security detail. We didn't get any emails on that. So do with that what you will. But we can say 100% the government of Alberta, government of Alberta resources were used to book hotel rooms for Marshall Smith and 
Becca Polak. But it gets even more interesting because one of the other records that we got was an email sent, and this gets to be important, May 15th, 2024 at 2.01 p.m. Let me just say that again so it sticks. This email was sent May 15th, 2024 at 2.01 p.m. It was sent by Shauna Shepard, who was again the executive assistant to Marshall Smith. Hi, Crystal. Can you please send requests to pays as soon as possible to Marshall Smith and Becca Polak? For $471.88, the attached invoices for hotels were paid by RIGR Mission and Planning P card. So right here it says, <coughs> excuse me, all of those hotel rooms, those six that were booked, were booked using a P card or a purchase card that was affiliated with Intergovernmental uh, Relations, Mission and Planning. Government infrastructure, government money was used to book all of those hotel rooms. But on May 15th, Shauna says, hey, can you uh, issue request to pays to Becca and uh, or sorry, Rebecca and Marshall? And this is, again, it gets to be fun because we only got one answer back. in the next step of the process. So uh, the the government said, hey, on May 15th, oh yeah, those two people, uh, super embarrassing. Uh, we totally used all of the government resources to, to pay for things. Um, and uh, we totally used all of the other things to, to make these trips happen. Um, and they were able to, and this is wild, the reason why it's $471.88 and not the, the 500 that's on the original invoice is because, not the 532, is because it was booked with government stuffs, they got a pass on the GST and the PST. So they each saved $50 because it was booked with government things. The payment, we were provided the payment records showing that in fact, Becca Polak did pay the money that day, May 15th, 234. She got the, the, the payment thinger. May 15th, 4.10 p.m., she paid the bill. Now, what's fascinating is we got sent those things saying the money was requested, the money was sent. We didn't get anything from Marshall Smith. Now, we're absolutely not saying for, I'm sure, a litany of legal reasons, that uh, Marshall Smith didn't pay the, the 471 discounted government rate, uh, less PST and GST, um, just because we asked for all of the records and we got Rebecca Polak's records, but we didn't get any saying that Marshall had paid. We're not saying that Marshall didn't pay. We have no evidence to say that Marshall didn't pay. We just find ourselves in the uncomfortable position of having no evidence to say that Marshall did pay. So there's that. So what do we know so far? Because there's a kicker coming. You have to know it. What do we know so far? What we know so far is that the, the trip, at least for the hotels, was booked by the government of Alberta. It was paid for by the government of Alberta using taxpayer money up until May 15th, when at the very least, Rebecca Polak, at the request of Marshall Smith's office, paid back the, the cheaper rate that she got because she was a government employee. What's the kicker? I mean, in and of itself, that's not great. Because government resources were used to book this trip for, for two staffers. Is there any way it could get more uncomfortable? You have to know the answer is yes. Because if you go back to the Globe and Mail story, Premier Daniel Smith attended a hockey game on personal time. None of her expenses were paid for by the government of Alberta, except for presumably that hotel room. Sam Black and her spokesman said in a statement, May 13th, 
Premier Smith traveled with two staff. Both paid their own expenses. The hockey tickets were provided by a private citizen. All rules under the Conflict of Interest Act were followed. Let me read that again. In a statement, May 13th, Premier Smith traveled with two staff. Both paid their own expenses. That appears to be a lie. Because it wasn't until May 15th that the request for payment was made. And we can prove, because we have the records right here, that that payment didn't get made until two days after Sam Blackett apparently said they paid on May 13th. It seems like, theoretically, a fairly small thing to to misrepresent. And... To be clear, there's nothing in this FOIP that says Sam Blackett wasn't told that they hadn't paid their own way. There's nothing to suggest in this FOIP that Sam Blackett in any way deliberately misled the Globe and Mail in issuing the statement on May 13th saying that they'd paid their own way. There's nothing. There's nothing to say that. Maybe, maybe he didn't know. Maybe he was told that they did. But they didn't. And at the end of the day, there's no getting around the fact that government resources were used to book this personal trip on personal time that resulted in two staffers getting a not, not insignificant discount of not having to pay the taxes of another province for their personal vacation time. And this is where, again, the question that should be asked by any reasonable person is there is a whole lot of bullshit going on with this situation. Why is there so much bullshit going on with this situation? Wouldn't it have been easier, simpler for Daniel Smith and co to have simply said, hey, you know what? Um we got given these tickets and we changed the rules. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with us accepting them. We invited, I don't know, a bunch of our closest friends. We invited the, the, the premier of BC. We invited uh, some other folks um, because we wanted to, the, 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 the tickets were nice. We didn't want to let the tickets go to waste. They were, they were super nice tickets. And yeah, maybe it's not a great look that it was given to them by an employee, uh, especially not a recent employee appointment to a board that has got some questionable spending activities. Um, But yeah, we just wanted to go. It was easiest and quickest for us to book all of the the tickets through the government of Alberta. So we did, but we always planned to, to have Becca and Marsh pay it back. It just took a little while to get all the communication sorted out. It's a nothing burger. It's nothing. It's nothing to worry about. Yeah, Daniel Smith stayed in a nice hotel, and so did Marshall Smith, and so did Becca Polak. But they paid the money back, so whatever. Don't worry about it. Or they're going to pay the money back. So whatever. Don't worry about it. That's not at all what happened. From day one, this situation has been misrepresented. It has been misdirected, and the press has been lied to. The Globe and Mail was clearly lied to now again i'm not saying that sam blackett was anything other than the deliverer of the lie and i'm not saying that he had any knowledge of the lie because he's already threatened to sue us twice but um clearly twas a lie and there have been a great many lies and so why is it that the staffers have clearly violated the conflict of interest regulations why is it that uh there's so much effort going into to covering this whole thing up and how did they get out there wonder what what plane they flew to go out there so many questions that could probably only be answered by doing a deep dive on who's everybody in that picture, which brings us, whoop, not that picture. That's Adrienne LaGrange. That one's easy. Which brings us, (laughs) 
to the end of the episode and the 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 little update for the next two weeks. This thing is such a complex mess. It is an unmitigated shit show of influence peddling and conflicts of interest. And I would feel comfortable calling it corruption at this point, given that we've got politicians and staffers deliberately lying to the public about violating their own regulations. Um, I feel like that's a safe assessment, given that the government, the information that the government has itself provided through FOIPs, instead of just being transparent, instead of just being accountable. So we're taking, we're going back to the, uh, the interview schedule for the next two weeks, which is to say we have two interviews that we are so excited to present that we're going to be recording over the next few days. One of them is going to go up on uh, the, the Sunday uh, and the other one is going to go up on the next Sunday because we need some time to uh, untangle this whole mess. And assuming, hopefully, again, super fingers crossed, hoping that the the real reporters and the real journalists, because we're just hacks and podcasters here, uh, that they are able to to tell this story in a complete and comprehensive way. Um, but as we have said since we first talked about this months ago the breakdown will not allow a universe to exist where as much of this information isn't made fully public before daniel smith's leadership review because it is simply an unavoidable conclusion that there has been a stunning amount of influence peddling of favoritism of potentially corruption that has gone on in the provincial government under Daniel Smith's watch. And the people who are attending that AGM who believe the lies that Daniel Smith serves up on the regular that have been documented on the regular, at least have the, the right to know how badly they're being lied to. And we'll probably do, uh, maybe next weekend is like a Thanksgiving thing. We'll, we'll, we'll find a way, maybe Monday night. We'll see what happens. Um, maybe Sunday night. We'll see what happens. We'll do, uh, we'll do another open mic special. Because one of the things that we have heard from a lot of you is we miss the open mics. And we miss the open mics too. I miss the open mics because I don't have to talk for two hours. I get to tag somebody in it after the first hour, and then we just have a nice little conversation. So make no mistake, this is not us shutting down the open mics because we don't like the open mics. We absolutely love the open mics, and I cannot wait to bring them back. So we're going to find a way to bring in a standalone open mic, and we'll make sure that we provide plenty of lead time so that anybody who wants to talk about any other things to do with Alberta politics can. And we're going to be back with our next uh, break down style episode um i just want to double check the date here on october 27th because that'll give us the the run in right into the the legislative session that'll give everybody who's attending the agm a week to digest everything um if you're looking for our brand of satirical, well-informed commentary on all of the goings-ons of Alberta politics, unless there's an emergency, um, then uh, please keep an eye on all of our, our socials, as the kids say. Um, but we're very excited to be presenting the interview episodes that we're going to hopefully be able to bring to you over the next two weeks before we come back with this whole dumpster fire. Um, and I already know what shirt I'm wearing for that episode. Let me tell you. All of that being said, this is where I got to do the, the plugs and the things and the stuff. So, first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to the chat. I haven't had a chance even tonight because it's been such, so busy and the video ship clips have been so short. I haven't had a chance to look at the chat at all. I'm really looking forward to signing off and getting a good look at the chat. Um, I want to thank you, everybody who's in in the chat, who's part of the the little community that we have going on here. You guys are so amazing, um, and it just fills my cup up to read all of the the comments from all of you and how you work with each other and you feed off of each other. So big thank you to everybody who is who is hanging out on the 
on the chat. Um, I want to say a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. We have, with all the stuff that's gone in the last week, we've already blown through our, 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 our uh, FOIP budget. We have a FOIP budget. We set aside money for FOIPs every month. We've already blown through that because of the amount of uh bullshit that the provincial government has has served up so we want to thank everybody who signed up to be our patreon supporters there because you keep the the lights on you keep the the gear going you keep all of the internet things happening um if you're somebody who wants to sign up to be one of our patreon sponsors you can do that at www.patreon.com slash the breakdown a b if you're somebody who's not big into the uh the the regular you're not looking for the long-term relationship um then you can send an e-transfer to info at the breakdown ab.ca um and uh we have some we have some things and stuff that we'll be rolling out uh as we get the results back um so big huge thank you to everybody who's supporting the show financially i also know that there's a lot of folks in our audience who do not have the means to do so and i don't want anyone feeling bad like share subscribe do all the social media things that come for free because all of that goes a long way to help us grow our audience and get us in front of more eyes and into more ears all of that being said tonight's episode was again was a bit i mean the last 20 minutes was fun i had a lot of fun with the last 20 minutes because i love catching these people and lies it's just fun um, but was a bit of a dirge for the first hour and a half. So as has become the breakdown tradition that we've returned to, here's your little, little clip of Danny. Over time. Uh, I tend to be pretty trusting. I don't, I don't. Not anymore, but that clip still makes me laugh every single time. Uh, big thank you to everybody who has uh, sat through the last two hours of this, whether you've done it live or you're watching the video uh, on one of our streaming platforms or you're listening to the podcast version after the fact. Thanks for thanks for showing up because um, it means a lot to all of us here. And I want to, that's the other thing I said I was going to say this week. Um, I want to be really clear here. Um, this show exists because of a team and i am so grateful and lucky and blessed in all of the positive words that i have the privilege of working with a team of people that do this show on a volunteer basis um many requiring an anon anonymity to do so but are passionate about speaking truth to power and holding the, the the people in the corridors of power to account. It is the one of the great privileges of my life that I get to be the voice for this show. And um, I can only do that because of the the amazing, amazing folks that that toil away in the in the background. So I just wanted to to say that because there was the, the people were starting, oh Nate's so awesome. I'm really not. Um, and it is the show is a thing because there's a lot of people who care and that's the the message that i want to leave this week with um it's i know it's fucking dark out there some days and when you have a premier who lies as much as she does and who is willing to mislead people when she knows the truth and she's willing to weaponize and harm kids in order to save her own political skin, that's that's bad. And I know with the free Alberta strategy, there's a lot of bad. And I don't want to minimize any of the, the bad. But I'll tell you this, the thing that keeps me showing up every week um, is the fact that there are so many good people who stand against this kind of thing. And a lot of them are just learning how to do it. But the vast majority of people don't want to be lied to. They don't want to be misled. Uh, and they know that they're better than what this current government is, is serving up. And so there's a lot of good people out there. They just, they just need to get loud.
and they are starting to get loud. I think that uh, I was talking to a friend a couple of days ago and I was saying, you know what? I think the there was the the COVID fatigue that set in where everybody was just like, oh, I just want to be done with this. And a lot of people kind of you know, that's why you, you you see the drop in the, the vaccine. Uh, one of the reasons, one of them is also shitty leadership, but that's why you see the drop in the vaccines take up. That's why you see not many people taking masks as, as seriously as they as they used to. And if somebody wants to wear a mask, fill your boots. Um, they shouldn't be derided for that. Um, but there is a fatigue of the COVID grievance that I'm starting to notice. A lot of people are starting to get fed up with the people who refuse to get up off the COVID cross that they have chosen to nail themselves to and continue to do so just so they can be the great victims of the pandemic. Um, the, the, the freedom folks, there's a lot of people are starting to get, it's, it's gone past the point and people are starting to, to get quite frustrated and uh, more than a little bit annoyed. And I think that, uh, those are the folks that I'm betting on, the ones that are saying, can we just have enough of the bullshit, please? And thank you very much. So that's my my spiel. Um, I, w- I will commit. We will find a way. Uh, I'm going to get some dirty looks for this, but we will find a way to make a live call-in show happening. Um, and uh, really looking for, I, I don't want to say the names of the, the folks that we have for the interviews yet because I don't want to jinx it because they're so good. But uh, we have those set up and keep an eye out for those. Um, keep your chins up. And we will see you at the very least. And here's the great news. I mean, here's the plus side. Um, if if the journalists, the real journalists, step up and they pull the trigger on this thing before the 26th, then we'll just be back with a regular roundup, and it'll be awesome. And that's what we all want to have happen. Um, so, you know, maybe it won't be that long. But otherwise, we'll see you for another roundup in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, and in between time, take care of yourselves. And as always, keep the conversation going.